departing the next day. Scripture records that he preached until midnight. Now, I can't say that I'm wanting to be before you a short time, but I can promise you that I won't preach as long as long. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're going to do communion today, but we're going to do communion a little bit differently today. I'm going to ask that the, that the things be passed out, but we're going to participate in communion during the message today, and I'll give you guys instructions. But if, if uh, those of you that are passing out would just go ahead and make sure that everybody has um, the communion cup. Um, the way that we look at communion, there is a lot of symbolism in communion. And I feel like today God wants me to share some of the symbolism and some of the revelations that are attached to communion. So, if you would, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 26. So again, that's Matthew 26, 26. And I want this service today to be very self-reflective. Mm -hmm. to, to look at yourself today, maybe in a way that you haven't before. Because realistically, when we start talking about this, communion is not just a religious ceremony. It's a renewal of a covenant and a reminder of what God did for us. So as we take a look at that today, look inward. So Matthew 26, 26, if you would all stand when you have it. And it will also be up here. So it says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. I pray, God, that I would be the first hearer of your word this morning and that you would touch each and every single person as we go throughout this service today. I thank you and I praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, before we get into the meat of the message, I want to talk about communion for just a second. First of all, communion is a covenant between man and God proclaiming the death of Jesus Christ until he returns. It says that in 1 Corinthians 11, 26. It says, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, it sounds a little bit more to say that we're celebrating his death. But think about his death for a moment. What did he accomplish with his death? When he was killed on the cross, he became the sacrifice. He became the sacrifice that allows each and every single one of us to have a relationship with God again. So if you think about biblical history, we're going to say that there's about a 4,000 year period between Adam and Jesus when man could not have a relationship with God. They were burning animals on altars to try to atone for the sins. They were shedding of blood of animals. There were all kinds of different types of offerings. If you, if you read through any of the Old Testament books, you will see 
long lists of instructions on what kind of offerings you're to give for forgiveness, what kind of offerings you're to give for this and for that, and, and all of those offerings were combined into one man. And he died on that cross for each and every single one of us. So we're not celebrating his death. We're celebrating what his death accomplished. Mm -hmm. We're celebrating the fact that for the first time in 4,000 years, we can have a relationship with God. Adam and Eve walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of the day in the presence of God, and then they fell, and that went away. Could you imagine not being able to have a relationship with God today? Where would we be? I'd still be burning a cap on an altar somewhere for all the crap I did. Mm -hmm. I'd have a couple cows lined up, like, you're next. <laughs> you know, it's one of those deals where what God did on that cross changed the future for all eternity. So we're not just eating a little wafer and drinking a little cup. We're celebrating the symbology of that covenant. Communion is also not to be entered into lightly. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 says, Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those that eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. That, that, that's scary. Amen. I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know where you all fall on that healthy fear of God scale, mm -hmm. but that, that statement is at the top. That statement for me is way up there. Mm -hmm. That statement, if you go into this lightly, you're bringing God's judgment on yourself. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but I want to make sure that I look at myself before I enter into that. Yeah. The next thing that communion does is it helps us stay closer to God. Mm -hmm. Scripture records, it says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Mm -hmm. That eternal life that comes from God. If we don't participate in communion, that we don't have that life in us, which, if you go back to the previous point that I made, makes it even scarier. So you have to examine yourself to see if you are prepared to take communion, but if you don't, there's also consequences. This is not a situation where we can look inward and say, well, I've got this, this, and this, so I can't take communion, but I'll be all right. Mm -hmm. This is a situation where you say, I've got this, this, and this, but I need to get it right so that I can do this. Amen. See, communion isn't just about a religious ceremony. It's about looking inside yourself and addressing the issues that you have going on in your own life so that you can have that eternal life. That's good. That's good. We can't simply sit back and be idle and say, well, God knows my heart. How many times have we heard that? Why well, I, I I know I fail in this area, but God knows my heart. If you really believe God knew your heart, you would change your heart. That's right. Amen. Because when you have that evil in there, you don't want God looking at that evil. Right. So to say God knows my heart, yeah, He does. Do you? That's right. Yeah. Do you know your heart? Because mm -hmm. we can't lie to God. Amen. Omission means something. It means He knows all. Mm -hmm. He only wants us to confess those things to make sure we know them too. Right. Because sometimes we walk around, you know, I, I, I think it's funny, you know, I used to say that. One of the biggest lies told on Sunday mornings is, how you doing, brother? Oh, I'm good. Blessed and highly favored. Yeah. <laughs> you can say it, but 
do you meet it? Is that really what's going on? Now, the second biggest lie is how are you doing? Because most people use that as a Next time somebody looks at you and says, how are you doing? You know, well, I've got all these issues going on. I'm dealing with a little bit of depression. I'm kind of stressed out. I get, they're going to tune you out instantly. And they're going to look at you like, I just met a <laughs> That's it. That's it. If hello is what you mean, say hello. <laughs> but when somebody says, how are you doing, most of the time, So because we know most of the time they don't care, we've adopted this I'm fine mentality. You say I'm fine long well enough, we start to believe it. Meanwhile, you got all these demons fighting with you in the background, and you don't know who you can go to to talk to. So if I say, how are you doing, and you start unloading on me, all right, we're going to start the prayer list. Okay. I don't know how to deal with that one, but I know he does, so I'll get him over here too. Come on over here, let's, you know, let's get together, let's pray to him. Let's be real people. Because when we fail to examine ourselves, like we were talking about in Sunday school this morning, if no one tells you who you are, or if you don't can tell you who they think you are. Right? Mm -hmm. Take a look at a kid that gets called a loser and stupid his entire childhood. What's he going to grow up to be? A stupid loser. It takes somebody to tell him there is real identity in Christ to overcome those things that the world says. There's a lot of things people told me when I was younger, and you know what? I believed them for a long time. I believed them for a long time. If I still believed a lot of those things today, I guarantee you one thing. What we say standing here. If by some miracle I had actually found a church, it wouldn't be this one. <laughs> Pastor Herman's laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. But the lies that we're told that become part of our identities, communion is what puts that lifeblood into you that gives you the relationship with Christ so that he can tell you who you are. If somebody's going to speak negative against me, let them. I don't care. Why don't I care? Because I know who God says I am. And when I know who God says I am, nothing else really matters. Mm, that's good. And the last reason that we celebrate communion is it promotes unity. 1 Corinthians 10, 17 says, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. And that's not just in this church, that's all churches. We're all declaring that these sacraments that we have for communion are the body and the blood of Christ. Every church is doing the same thing. We are not just celebrating communion with this body. We're celebrating communion with every believer that takes communion. Because we are all one body. It's about unity. Again, in Sunday school. I'm going to quote Sunday school a lot. So if you're not coming to Sunday school, you're going to miss some of these references. So just come on out to Sunday school and you'll get it next week. Amen. One of the things that I always used to say is I don't like people. And I've come to terms that it's not that I don't like people. I don't like crowds. Okay, I don't like, like when I was in Hong Kong, when we were walking down the street of Hong Kong, it was, it was great because I could see over everybody, but I was also walking like this. <laughs> because they don't, they don't believe in personal space in some countries. So... You know, you're walking down the street and you've got one person touching you here and another person touching you here. Somebody bumping into you from behind every time the people in front of you stop. It's like, there's an anxiety that comes with being in a situation like that for me. But I love people. about personal space. But unity 
has more to do with the atmosphere than the attitude. See, because you can create an atmosphere of unity when everybody has an attitude of dissension. See, because the atmosphere of unity is created by the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't matter what everybody thinks. Because in every church, there's people that disagree sometimes. Disagreement is not disunity. Until you start to get other people involved in trying to create division. That goes against communion. When we partake of communion, we're agreeing with the mission of this house. We're agreeing with Pastor Sermon and Shanika. We're agreeing that we're all coming together as one body to worship God and to learn about God together. So Jesus took the bread. Now what does the bread symbolize? The first thing it symbolizes is devotion. Acts 2 and 42 says that they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, I used to say three things you can do to get closer to God is you can worship, you can pray, and you can read your Bible. This scripture clearly identifies a fourth one. You can commune with other believers. See, and that's vital. Like we talked about in Sunday school, oddly enough, uh, you can't separate yourself and grow. As iron sharpens iron and the fellowshipping with other believers helps us to have accountability in certain scenarios. Now, let's, let's think about the bread for a second. Elijah went to a widowed woman in a town and he said, hey, go get me some water. And with your hand, bring me some bread. And the widow said, but sir, I only have a tiny bit left. I was going to make what I have left and me and my son are going to eat it and then die. And Elijah says, go get me a piece of bread. Elijah was going off of what God told him. God told him there was a widow in the town that was going to feed him. So whatever her circumstances were was not important to Elijah. What was important was what God said. See, because her circumstances said she had enough left to make a little bit of bread for her and her son to eat, and then they would be out, no more food, they're going to die. That was her truth. But God's truth, Elijah said, go make me the bread, and your flour and oil will never run dry. So she did. She went, she made it. She gave him the bread. And guess what? Her oil and flour never ran dry. <clears throat> Sometimes your blessing is tied into the one thing you're holding on to the most. Yeah. And God is saying, give that to me, yeah. and I will bless you. But we hold on to it because we're like, this is all I've got. Yeah. This is all I have. And you're asking me to give it to you. And God says, yes, give it to me, and I will bless you with more than you could ever use. That is the bread that we break in communion. That is the bread that we break, because Jesus Christ is the bread. He says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. It's not like the manna that the children of Israel ate, because they ate that and died. But his bread, he says, you eat it and you will live forever. He is the bread. The bread is what his body is. What else did Jesus do with bread? When he was preaching, 
and he saw the masses and his disciples came to him and said, look, we don't have enough money to feed all these people. But this little boy over here got five loaves and two fish. And God said, cool. I can work with this. So he took it and he blessed it. And I'm going to read this next part because I think it's important to show. In John 6, it's the five loaves and the two fish. So he took the five loaves and gave thanks for them and distributed them to the 5,000 plus people that had come. Five loaves. He blessed it. He broke it. And he told his disciples something very key. And it's something that I missed for a very, very long time. And when God showed me this word last week, I got really excited. And I even shared with Pastor Herman, I said, I'm excited about what God is showing me for this. When they were giving it out, Jesus told them to give them all that they wanted. He didn't tell them to give them crows. He didn't tell them to give them what was left. He said, give them what they want. Now keep in mind, when we're talking about 5,000, that's probably 5,000 men. So if we include women and children into this thing, it could be 15,000 people. Five loaves. He blessed it. He broke it. He said, give each person as they want. And when they were all done, they collected 12 more baskets full. What God is showing us that he is the bread is that he doesn't just have a little bit for everybody. He is more than enough for everybody to have as much of him as they want. That's good. That's good. And if we think we're doing too much and we're asking too much of God, there's still 12 baskets left over. If he can feed 5,000 people with five loaves, yeah. imagine what he can do with 12 baskets full. Yeah. See, we say all the time, I pray for everybody else, but I don't pray for me. Or my prayers are insignificant because I'm dealing with a hangnail and that person's got cancer, so I'm not going to pray for myself. But God wants you to pray for yourself because he has more than enough for every single person and everything they need from him. His bread doesn't run out. Yeah. It keeps going. It's eternal. His bread gives us all we need for every day. The Lord's Prayer specifically says, give us this day our daily bread. Mm -hmm. What is our daily bread? Bread can be anything. Bread can be that new job. Bread can be the money that you need to pay for your bills. Bread can literally be food. Give us this day our daily bread means give us what we need today. Mm -hmm. And if we think we're asking God for too much, remember there's still 12 baskets. I can't stress that enough. When every single person got everything that they wanted, there was still more. People say you can't outgive God. That's because God still got 12 baskets. He started with five loaves. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can feed this whole church right now with five loaves of bread. We can try. God can feed every church in Hampton Road with five loaves of bread. We still have more. So bread can talk about anything that we need. Now I want y'all to think about this. I had an idea for today. I'm so glad I didn't do it. I was going to bring the bread machine and set it up here. <laughs> and I was going to turn it on. Because how many of y'all, when you smell that fresh baked bread, and your salivary glands start to go a little bit, and you're like, ooh, I need to keep baking bread. I hope there's enough bread for everybody. Meaning, I hope I get some of that fresh baked bread. At Christmas, when I was making Parker House rolls from scratch, 
My dad walked in, he goes, you making bread? Yes, I am. Because that smell. Even people I know that are gluten-free, they're like, that's awesome smelling, dude. <laughs> but that smell of freshly baked bread just draws people in. And it gives them a desire. Why don't we have that same desire for Christ? That same anticipation of that freshly baking bread just makes people want it more. When God is the bread of life, we should desire Him more than anything on this earth. But I think that there is a reason that God made the combination of flour, eggs, water, and milk smell and taste so delicious. Oh. Because what it means to us, it, it shows us a desire, a palpable desire for Him. And that's what we should have. So if we peel back that top layer, and we take the piece of bread. Now knowing that this bread represents everything you need. Mm -hmm. Represents everything you need. It represents his body. It's breaking. Yeah. Because <laughs> I hate to break it to you. 
to you, we're all called to share the gospel of Christ within the Great Commission. Amen. No matter what ministry gifting God gives you, whether it's prayer, cleaning, evangelism, teaching, preaching, whatever it is, right. we're all called to share God with the world. That's good. Every single one of us. But it's in that cup. <clears throat> that cup that we drink of is not simply his blood. It represents everything that he has for us. And we don't always get called to do what we desire to do. That's another thing. Sometimes we don't want to do what God calls us to do, but sometimes we look at our passions and our desires as, well, you know, God gave me this desire because he wants me to do this. I desire to go hunting. Can that be my ministry? It could. But it's not my call. I know where God has called me. I know what he's called me to do. I have to separate that from the things that he has given me passion for, the things that he has made, things in my life that I enjoy doing. That doesn't necessarily mean that those are all my call. His cup is eternal. John 4.14 says, But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never thirsty again. The water that I give him will become into a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now he says that in reference to the Samaritan woman. He goes into the village and he says, woman, give me a drink of water. And she's basically, what are you doing talking to me? I'm a Samaritan. But then he goes on to explain to her that the water that he gives is eternal. Then when you drink it, you'll never be thirsty again. We just said that the cup represented what God has for us. So there is an empty feeling that we all have. An emptiness. And we're always thirsty, and we're always seeking how to quench our thirst. Some people do it with drugs. Some people do it with sex. Some people do it with gambling. Some people do it with improper relationships. Some people do it with mindless activities. But everybody is trying to quench a thirst that is on the inside of us. And God is saying, to quench your thirst, all you have to do is what I have for you. Do what I have called you to do and you will never be thirsty again. There are people in this world spending millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars trying to quench a thirst that can't be quenched by anything in this world. How many of y'all try? Like four of us? Really? Trying to quench that thirst? Oh. Okay. Yes. Okay. I'm not the only one that used to not be saying. But we spend so much time trying to quench a thirst that all we have to do is say, God, mm -hmm. what is it that you have for my life? And you'll never be thirsty again. Yeah. You know, Pastor Hurt and I were talking about ministry before service today. We both agree that this is not something that is easy. And it's not something that is fun because Scripture records that we have to give an account for every single thing that we've said or done in this ministry. That, that kind of makes me a little bit nervous. But then I told him at the same time, I'm like, even though sometimes it doesn't always feel good to get up here and preach, <clears throat> every time I do it, I get the satisfaction. It's that thirst. It's that thirst that God is quenching by doing what I'm that's the satisfaction. When I leave here after Sunday morning, whether it's standing up here preaching or back there behind the soundboard or in prayer or doing communion or whatever it is that you do in this church, there's a sense of satisfaction that you get from it because it's the cup God has for you. Mm -hmm. That's why when you leave, everybody talks about how I felt real good when I left church by Monday I didn't feel so hot. Let's see, this Sunday morning you were filling that thirst by doing what God has called you to do, but then some of us on Monday, we're back into the grind, and the furthest thing from our mind 
will say to you, when we participate in communion, it is not a religious ceremony. It is not about eating a little wafer and drinking a little grape juice. It is a remembrance of everything that Christ did on the cross for us. Mm -hmm. And everything that he's blessed us with. Thank you. 